The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. had alternate titles for the message, but uh, we're calling it Mature Sons. And those of you who remember last week, Jennifer talked about there is a, a pattern in the, in the body of Christ to teach either a low gospel or a high gospel. Do you remember that, that terminology? Low gospel basically is a real watered-down version. Um, and in part, historically, it happened as the gospel in... The United States spread from the East Coast to the West Coast. It got basically watered down in the process. But in many places, it's, uh, there's a lack of sound theology. There's a lack of depth to the gospel. That it's not just get saved and I'm done. Right? Um, that's the low gospel. And I don't ever have to do anything because everything was already accomplished. But mature sons. Um, I look back... And I saw patterns that to me are unmistakably clear for all believers. So you can't say, well, this don't apply to me. This is for somebody else. I've seen a pattern of hindrance to true spiritual growth. And I want to cover what that, that enemy is. We ought to, if you identify the enemy and you bring it to light, then at least you personally can see if it applies to you and if you need to deal with it. Okay? So I want to talk about mature sons. Mature sons. And... The first way to recognize a mature son is basically one that is adopted. You know, when you see that word adoption in your Bible, that does not mean adoption like in our country where you can adopt a baby. Adoption as sons were mature sons that were fully matured to take over the father's business. That's adoption. And the part that stands out to me in that maturing process, before you can take over daddy's business, so to speak, before you can take over the business, there's a maturation period that comes at a ratio in Jesus' life. Isn't he the best example? In his life, it was a ratio of 10 to 1. 30 years in making the man for three years of ministry. And then the father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, launched him into his ministry. But school, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Real maturation comes by the school of life. And I run into Christian after Christian, and, and this is my passion. I, I want to raise up leaders. I want everyone to be a leader, regardless of your realm, whether you're a, uh, in business or, or ministry full-time. And by the way, only 1% are really called to full-time ministry. So by and large, you better learn how to minister in the marketplace. That's your arena. That is your mission field. It's not in a church building or in a church gathering is not your primary ministry. Your primary ministry is how you minister the gospel in real life. And uh, I've always run into people that wanted, oh, but I want... They, they saw the glamour of standing behind a pulpit and something. I'm going, yeah. how many people tried to start ministries but they didn't understand people, and they didn't have the maturation period. They knew their Bible inside out and backwards and thought that was their qualification. Then all of a sudden they had to deal with people, and they found out, oh my goodness. <laughs> Jesus, I love it. It's these people I don't know what to do with. No, you're going to have to, maturation is you're going to love them both, and you're going to have to learn how to deal and navigate with different types of of people, and you're going to have to know your audience. You're going to have to know how to effectively have a word in season to them that are weary. And you have to know where they're coming from, where they're at. You have to identify the people that God brings into your life. And you don't cookie cutter your answers. You basically tailor it toward the individual. And you're going to have to know them according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. Now, if there was a principle number one, I saw that Isaiah 61.3, that God uses a word 
that uh, I think the modern church doesn't really like it. But he used the word planting. He said, to appoint to them that mourn in Zion. I want to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So far it's pretty good. That they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Planting is a significant aspect. And in most cases, church people are like tumbleweeds. Without roots, they just roll from place to place to place. Um, I'm kind of glad I got an email from my sister. She said, for the last 20 years, I've just been kind of church hopping. And, and she said, I finally found the place. And I'm going, you know what? You could have found that a lot sooner if you really would have realized how important that was. But we evaluate based on activity and not on what God is speaking. We evaluate with the reasoning mind, not what God is speaking. What basically you should be looking for is the planting of the Lord. Because in this planting, um, when I left uh, Pennsylvania and came here cold with one scripture and, and, and guidance from the Lord, he said, the city in which you've been taken captive... Charlotte, pray for its peace, for in it shall be your peace. That was my only instruction. How many people would abide by one verse? They'd be going, well, what about, what about this and what about that? You can, you can do that forever, can't you? Well, what about this? Where, where will I work? What am I going to do for a living? How am I going to? But basically, what the confirmation was the minute I pulled into Charlotte, there was a, I, I pulled in this little place, I didn't even know what it was, it had some children's toys, and I pulled in and a guy rolled his window down and he says, you're waiting, to, I'm sitting here to give you directions. God told me to stay in this car, someone was going to ask me for directions. Is that pretty good confirmation when you just leave a city cold with no plan, no arrangements whatsoever? Up and leave everything that you know and that's familiar. And you'd be surprised how much you trust in the familiar. You know where you go to the grocery store, you know where you get gas, you know, you know who you would go to for this, you know who you go to. But go into a place knowing no one and knowing that God is with you and how superior that is to all the plans of man. Hmm? And following that, God basically said, actually they had a Russian missionary who didn't know me from Adam walked up to me and said, I've got a word for you. It's Acts 17, 26. In the NIV translation, it says, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the exact place and the exact time in which they should live. There is an exact place for you to be, and there's an exact time. I'm concerned that the church, if it doesn't mature, will always be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I've used the illustration of my first church when they came to church for the wrong reason. Some young boys came, and they were on fire for God. But the word got out that there was a half a dozen young men that came, single. The following week, six half a dozen single girls came. They didn't see those single men because those single men went somewhere else. If, you're, if your motive is wrong, you're always going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. If it's a lustful motive, if it's a selfish motive, what you need to do is find out what is God saying and then get planted. You are called to be trees of righteousness. The implication is that you're rooted. And without rooting, I've, never, I've, I've seen people come through horrendous difficulties, but they were rooted. And there's a benefit to it. Now, I'm living, after 42 years in ministry, the excuses never change. They're always the same. It's like sin. There's no new sin. Billy Graham said that. There's no new sin. We change the names. <laughs> we call it different things. But it's the same. It's always been there. But God's basically saying, I have appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. And God sets the solitary in families. Now he brings those out who are bound into captivity, into prosperity. Those that are bound, he brings into prosperity. But the rebellious, they dwell in a dry land. 
I've run into people that do the three R's. If you know anybody like this or if you do this, quit it. This is an indication that there's nothing good coming upon your life in that current attitude. Attitude determines your performance. And here's the three R's. Rebellion, resistance, and rebuttal. <laughs> do you know anybody like that? There's always a rebuttal. There's always a resistance to anything you say. It's almost like they purposely take the opposite even if they don't believe it. <laughs> Rebellion, rebuttal, and resistance. And God basically says, you know, there's two ways that I want to plant my people. If you read Mark chapter 4, you read the parable of the soil, you know, some that brings forth three. That's really a parable of the heart. And it depends on how you hear. You could actually call Mark chapter 4 the hearing heart. How you receive the word, how you relate to that word, how you build an intimate relationship with the living word. And it will determine how you produce. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. So you want the heart that is not choked out by the cares of the world, etc., etc. And I saw that you're planted two ways. One, and the most important, is to the degree you are planted in Him. Intimacy with God. Get your roots down in Him. Rooted and grounded, built up and established. That's the, that's the way he, he plants and that's the way He builds. But He expects a root system. You are, what, did, what was one of the uh, uh, parable of the soils? They had therefore no root in themselves. That's their relationship with them and God. No root in themselves. Oh, they were saved. But that was just, it was superficial. The soul pretty much dictated how they lived their life. Watchman Nee used to say, you can be born again and still live a confined, restricted life because the flesh rules. So yes, you got Jesus in you, you just don't let him do anything. Now, mature sons are those that are going to know what it's like to be planted in him. Jennifer's message last week was hidden in Christ. And it made a beautiful distinction between low gospel and high gospel. Um, but it, you are not only to be planted in Christ, you're also to be planted. He places the solitary in families. You will never mature without getting planted. And my favorite excuse that I've heard for 42 years from seasoned biblical Christians, I'm part of the universal body of Christ. You know, that's an excuse for saying, I don't have a quality relationship. I'm not rooted anywhere. That's a tumbleweed. And the funny thing is with tumbleweeds, that even Jeremiah says, when provision comes, they can't see it. It'll be right in front of their eyes that God sent you provision, and you'll be whining and moping and tumbleweeding through life as a Christian and saying, ah, God's not doing this for me. God's doing plenty for you, but there is a lack of roots. Roots, basically, in Him. Here's, here's a little, <laughs> if you want to call it a formula. Remember, they got excited and then fell away quickly because they had no root in themselves. They had no depth, no root. No root, no depth. Isn't that true? No depth, no root. No roots equals no depth. No roots, no depth equals no fruit. But they that were planted in the house of the Lord, their roots went down. They flourished in the courts of God. Their fruit remained even in difficult times. We're afraid of rooting. And this is, this is what I was going to originally title the message. False independence is plaguing the church. It's a spirit and it convinces people that independence is a sign of maturity. Does that sound? Sounds feasible. I don't want to be sickly dependent. I don't want to say, oh, I need other people. I grew up. 
I was nine years old and wouldn't let my dad go in the shoe store with me because I didn't want my friends to think that I was a sissy. Nine years old. Give me the money in the car and I'm going in and buying my shoes by myself. I want to be grown up and independent. Now, where I lived in South Chicago, I think it happened a little too fast. <laughs> but you understand that that's, that was what maturity meant. Being independent. And in the natural, it's true. You don't want to be sickly dependent on anybody. God wants you to stand on your own two feet. But that's not the epidemic. The epidemic is that once you stand on your own two feet, you never mature enough to become interdependent. You know the best benefit I had? I had 20 years at least as a baby Christian that I spent meeting with pastors weekly. And I think the only reason they let me in was because they saw me on fire. They were all seasoned. They were all at least 20 years my senior, age-wise. But Dennis is all on fire, so they'd have me come in. And a lot of times they would take stuff I was getting and then they, they could perfect it and preach it. I heard my sermons from my revelation being preached by seasoned preachers. But it was the most beneficial because they straightened me out too. You have to be, if you're going to become a mature son, and I'm using sons, you know we're the bride of Christ. So ladies, you're not off the hook here. Mature sons, that's all of us. If the men have to be the bride of Christ, you can be mature sons. All right? I don't want no confusion here. <laughs> this, this bride wears combat boots. Right? Huh? We're a militant group. But I saw that the best thing in my life was to have somebody who had more experience that I could bounce stuff off of and it saved me a lot of aggravation. They told me the mistakes they made and I listened to that. If you're a young person or you've been in ministry for a long time and you've never had that, quite frankly you could be doing more damage to the body of Christ than good. Do you realize that? You could. You could be doing more damage for the gospel because you're so ruggedly independent. The conditions of those that are healthy, Isaiah 41 says, I'm going to open rivers in the desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys, and I'm going to make the wilderness a pool of water. The dry land is going to spring. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, the oil tree. I will set them in the desert, the cypress, the pine, the box. And you, know, you know, it hit me all of a sudden. All of these trees are planted together. Kind of like a congregation. It's a forest. <laughs> they work the best, not in isolation, but in community. And God's basically saying, the box tree, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The condition of people who have failed to establish a root both in Christ and in the body Here's the favorite expression. So I'm exposing it. Let's bring it to the light. This is where I see false independence. Well, I can't be limited. I'm part of the larger body of Christ. And so far, that attitude, I have never seen them not struggle. I've seen people with serious problems that were rooted and they got through it. And they had the affirmation of other people who had been there, done that. The other ones are looking for something and there's a couple fears involved there. Usually the first one is they're afraid they're going to lose their identity. Oh my goodness, I'm a red potato. If I become part of something bigger, I'm just going to be a mashed potato and no one's going to ever see my gifting or ever identify who I am. I will be lost in the crowd. You know what? Good. You need lost. You really do. You really need to die to that big time me. That's too much self in there. I'm talking from experience here. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is a man who trusts in man, and that means you, 
<laughs> not just in some other man. Cursed is the man that trusts in themselves. And makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Jeremiah 17, this is verses 5 and 6. Listen to verse 6, in the, uh, <clears throat> if we expanded it. For he shall be like a shrub, tumbleweed, in the desert. He shall not see when good comes. A tumbleweed is blind to provision because self is the primary lens. What's in it for me? As opposed to God who wants to reveal provision but it requires some stability. Now, it says, they are unable to see provision but they will inhabit the parched places in the wilderness rather than the courts of the Lord. In a salt land which is not inhabited, inhabited, it's isolated and there's no help. How many of you know Christians that you know they love God, but they're out there struggling, but it's basically, I don't need to go to church, I'm turned off at church, or I was offended at church. That's as common as ever. But guess what? There's, there's no way you will ever fulfill your destiny or see the kind of life that God intended for you as a tumbleweed. It's impossible. Someone's got to tell them. And if you're a friend, you'll tell them that. And that part of the universal church is a deceptive concept. It only shows you that you do not have the ability to be interdependent. And that's false independence. In the maturation process, even with little children, a baby is dependent. No question about it. They need you. But the goal is for a parent, for that ch child to learn to walk by themselves, to stand on their own two feet, and then usually around the teen years, in my case nine, <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm smarter than all those people that are older than me. <laughs> and we take that as a badge of maturity. Oh, that's old-fashioned. Come on. Are those old people old-fashioned? You, know you know what's interesting? We read this uh, uh, portion of, of, um, from a book, and it talked about all of the world views that have existed since time began, even particularly towards sexuality, just worldview. Everything that some of the young people think is modern, it's been there since before the beginning of time. It's nothing new. We changed the names. So when you think you're being cool and modern, it already existed before that worldview. Paganism, morality, paganism, morality. It shifts historically. It's nothing new under the sun. But if God wants you to establish roots, you're going to have to have relationship with God and people. There's just no two ways around it. Because otherwise you're isolated. One of the signs of a false independent spirit is really there's no focus. They're to and fro in the doctrine. Unstable, irregular, and are prone toward failures. Of course, then they get mad at God, like it's His fault. You see any of those characteristics? No focus, to and fro with doctrine, unstable, irregular, and a lot of cases of failure. Oh, and then when they fail, guess what they tell you it is? Spiritual warfare. I know leaders that are not in as much spiritual warfare as some of these people. That's your own carnality beating you up. Yes, there's spiritual warfare. But when you are steadfast, stable, when you're secure in who you are, when you're rooted in Jesus, completely rooted and grounded in Him, then you learn to stand. 
and consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials because basically the testing of your faith produces patience and patience brings forth the promises. You have a different attitude than, poor me, I'm under spiritual warfare. I am so weary of spiritual warfare f coming from people who do nothing. Why, does it, why would the enemy have to attack you? He don't even need to attack you. You're not doing anything. <laughs> right? But God's calling forth, I, I am the opposite of seeker friendly. Maybe God calls people to that. He didn't call me to that. He called me potatoes belong in potato patches, tomatoes in tomato patches. If you're a tomato and this is a potato patch, you need to leave. <laughs> I'm better at kicking them out. I want you to grow up before you go up. I don't want a watered down gospel to make you feel comfortable. I could probably scare a few people just by saying, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Isn't that what Jesus did? I lost a few on that. That's not, that probably wasn't in the church growth program. Huh? How to increase numerically. I want maturity. I was called to full stature. Full stature is the emphasis. Others are called to different functions in the body. You do what God's called you to do, but by golly, if we don't start challenging people to grow up, we're going to settle for a low gospel. And then you're going to pass. And whatever you permit as parents with your children, like uh, sometimes you go to church, sometimes you don't go to church, they will take it to an extreme because of what you modeled. You're giving them an excuse to not grow up. Did you know that? But I'm part of the larger body of Christ. No focus, to and fro doctrine, unstable, irregular, and lots of history of failure. You see, there's nothing wrong with failure. <laughs> it's in being a failure. Fail, but don't be a failure. It's okay to fail. Learn from it. Get up. Dust yourself up. Say, I don't want to do that again. That teaches you to be a resilient believer that learns from their experience and, and from the school of hard knocks, as some people call it. That's true. That's, it's one of the best teachers because, boy, you remember some of those lessons. And... But the condition of those that are rooted are blessed and whose hope is in the Lord. There's, a, there's another key with this rugged, independent, false independent spirit and thinking they're mature. They basically also have a concept that <clears throat> they're always bummed out that they didn't get what they wanted from God because their hope was not rooted in Him. Their hope was rooted in an outcome that they were rooting for. You're setting yourself up for disappointment every time. You quit rooting for an outcome. When you really love the Lord, you want to be so rooted in Him that no matter what your circumstances are, you're steadfast and immovable. And you consider pure joy because you know you're, I am where God wants me to be and I'm doing what God wants me to do. And quit looking for greener pastures. In reality, you should be looking for deeper roots. Amen. God told me that what he was doing in me one time, he spoke to uh, prophetically through Hurricane Dennis. <laughs> that was kind of obvious for me. <laughs> Hurricane Dennis was on the east coast around New Bern, North Carolina, in that area. And what it did was, it wasn't the strong winds, it was the saturation, that the rain just wouldn't relent. And it rained and rained to full-grown trees with deep roots were just toppling over. And God said, basically, that's to be a challenge to you, that I want your roots to go down so deep that that could never happen. That's the attitude you should be rooted in Christ. But you can't be that rooted in Christ and still be a uh, tumbleweed without relationships, without knowing your DNA. And by the way, Kirk, that was part of what I saw in the Spirit for you. He's going to reveal your DNA because up until now it's not been clear. That was the impression I was getting. And he's going he's gonna to reveal that to you and fortify it and it's going to bring great stability and blessing with it. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, not in an outcome. Hope in an outcome is not hope in the Lord. The result, you will be like a tree planted by waters. You'll be healthy. 
these rugged independent people with this living in this false independence and thinking they're too mature are actually not healthy. And it's always somebody else's fault. What are they afraid of in church? Somebody's going to stand between me and my ministry. Nothing's ever going to stand between you and your ministry. That's a, that's a fear tactic that the enemy uses on you. God, God will make room for anybody that's pursuing Him. Basically, they'll say, I'll be like a tree planted by the waters. I'll be healthy. It spreads out its roots by the river. That means it's going to grow and flourish, and it's going to be more deeply planted. It will not fear when there's a short-term trial because the roots are down deep and it'll start producing fruit when they'll be producing fruit when they're going through a trial and really the key and actually the Lord did this to me by a spiritual father that I had he said Dennis don't tell the congregation the stuff that you're going through because you have a platform for other people to hear your prayer requests but there's a lot of hurting people that don't have that same platform (laughs) And I found out there was another point of wisdom in it, is that they actually start believing you never have any. (laughs) But you know what? If that gives them hope, so be it. But you know what? I don't think I've ever been bummed out that I can't go to church. I don't think I've ever... Bummed out is a sign of immaturity. Mom, I don't want to go to church. You have to go to church. You're the pastor. Oh, okay. (laughs) Did you ever see that commercial on television where the little kid's in the crib and the dad says, Son, I'm taking the day off. (laughs) Fend for yourself. But you know what impressed me over the years? If I made something so hard, people showed up willingly. This is really hard to take this course. Those are the ones they sign up for. If I said, we're going to do a basic theology course, everybody was above basic. (laughs) So I decided we're just going to teach you everything that's really hard. And you'll love it because it was, it was, wow, was that hard. The result is you grow, you flourish. You'll not fear when there's short-term trial. Your leaf will be green. And you will not be anxious in the year of drought because roots that are deep enough to sustain life flow are not shallow and they will not cease from yielding fruit. I mean... The trials in Jennifer and I's life have ebbed and flowed. They've ebbed and flowed before I met Jennifer. They ebb and flow, but they have never stopped me. And this is in all honesty, it probably sounds prideful, but it's not to be taken that way. I never stopped bearing fruit. I can look backwards and see the books we've written and the proof. And much of the fruit came out of situations that other people would have been bummed out about. Where we had to find... Oh my goodness, what do I do now? It's chaos. Everything's falling apart. Find a solution for it, a redemptive solution. That becomes your testimony. You have that choice instead of just being whining. Really. Those are your two choices. You can, remember we talked about that some weeks ago about resilience? That there are unsaved people that are resilient who lived in abject poverty and somehow made something of themselves. Did you know that you have a capacity in you, in your mind, to make a trauma worse than it really is? Did you know for another person, they could blow off the same thing that you got traumatized with? You have a capacity to make it big in you. So you can either have a big, big God and an itsy-bitsy devil, or you can have a big, big trauma all the time. You could make mountains out of molehill all the time. You have that capacity. But you also have the capacity to learn to 
drop quickly and surrender and enter into the keeping power of the Lord. He will keep you even in the midst of, oh my goodness, everything's falling apart. I should, in, if I was in my right natural physical mind, I would be terrified right now. But instead, I'm going, Jesus, I'm staying there, being kept. Uh, keeping power is available. But it's just a question, do you, do you surrender to him in the, in the time of difficulty or do you try to fix it? Listen to me, fixers. It doesn't work. It's like you need reality therapy. Is what I'm doing working? If not, perhaps I need a new plan. I'm giving you the new plan. Drop down to your spirit. How about the people that tell me, but, but pastor, things are, went, went crazy and I couldn't drop down. Oh, you can drop down. What you didn't do is surrender. There's no such thing as I can't drop down. What you mean is you didn't complete the process. You dropped out, oh, Jesus, but then you wanted, you wanted to fix it. <laughs> Good, that doesn't work. He didn't need your help. He wanted you to surrender to him. Drop down, quick down, quick in. When we studied the greats, I'm talking about people that loved and lived the way Jennifer and I lived. I want the high gospel. I want the things that I've not experienced yet. I want the glory of God. I want the presence of the Father. I, I preached this when I was 26 years old, that the next great revelation would be the revelation of the Father. We've had revelation of Jesus. We've had revelation of the Holy Spirit. We desperately need a revelation of the Father. And it's never left ever since I was in my 20s. And understanding that mature sons is what would be required to even be a spiritual father. Because what we have is boy leaders. And I'm not talking chronological. Though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. You've got boy leaders. And that's actually the actual translation of that, boy leaders. You have 10,000 boy leaders, and they can't take you farther than they are themselves. So my passion for full stature was, God, I've got to go as far as I can. I've got, to, I've got to milk every negative experience and find out the redemptive side of this so that you have an answer for someone who's going through it and perhaps you can save them the, the pain, unnecessary trial and tribulation. Say that with me. Unnecessary trial and tribulation. Doesn't that sound like something you want to get rid of? Well, if God brings us to the place to where he's got a pattern for our lives, both corporately and individually, to be... Listen to Colossians 2, 5 through 7. Paul says, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order. He's talking to a corporate, not talking to one person. To see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received him, so walk. Rooted, built up, and established. There's a pattern. If you, want, you think you've got a better pattern than that, then you're going to be a tumbleweed. There's no better pattern than being rooted in God, rooted in a family. Find your DNA. Find your tribe. When we first started a church, we had 10 people. And I can remember Glenn always used to comment on it. Oh, this is another one of those garden sermons where he's going to kick people out. We only, we only got 10 people and Dennis is kicking them out. <laughs> well, you could hear it that way. That's not my intention. But by golly, find out where your DNA is. Find out who you belong to. There's a place of connection. If you weren't so ruggedly, selfishly independent, you would know. But the provision, God has placed divine appointments in your life. They could be at work. It could be that guy you don't like at work. Too bad. It isn't about your likes and your dislikes. Grow up. It's about God's sovereign planning. I remember one of the most instrumental people in, in my personal life since I moved to Charlotte was someone that everybody in my church wanted to kill. <laughs> and they were very beneficial. God used them. So before you kill somebody, ask God about it, all right? <laughs> He may have placed them there just to see what's in your heart. Ah. 
That's why he puts that slow person on the road when you're in a hurry. (laughs) The exact time and the exact place in which you should live so that God can let you see what's in your heart. I shouldn't be stealing Jennifer's sermon to me. Honey, the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. That's God's road. I know where this is going. I've already repented. Those are God's people. That's important, too, because you see them as cars obstructing your plan and purpose in life. You, king of the road. Who made you, like the Lord spoke to me once, who made you king of the public parking lot? Because I was complaining that people, it's like two feet to the door. Why, don't, why did they leave their carts so they can crash into the cars parked next to them? Why can't they just take them back or put them in the, wherever they belong? And God spoke to me very clearly. Who made you king of the public's parking lot? That's not your jurisdiction. Look what's in your heart. Huh? You want to get rooted in God, you've got, you've got to walk in the light as He is in the light. And if your joy is not overflowing, guess what? You need to ask God what's, what's in the way. What's coming between you and I? Steadfast Colossians uh, 111. Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. That's all of life. You know, you, there's no wiggle room there, is there? With joy. Now, how do you do that without God? Can you be steadfast in all circumstances and patient with people with joy? Then find out why. Walk in the light as He in the light. You have the blood of Jesus continually cleanses you. I pray that that you had fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, that your joy might be full. If your fellowship is not producing joy that is full, there's a signal there. It should be a signal. It should be a red light to find out. You know, it's like walk in the light as He is in the light. When you walk in the light, if light increases... You can tell whether that's a table in the room or a piano. The light will make manifest what's there in the way. Are we afraid to ask Him? Do we make excuses? Rather than saying, why is my joy not full? Lord, shine the light. Let me see what's really there. That will restore the joy of the Lord into your heart and light because you walk in the light as He is in light, you will have fellowship one with another. And the Fellowship with one another means God and people. Oh, goodness, there's so much good stuff here. One of the key ingredients that the Lord taught me was that irresponsible children... Do not reap what God has planned for them in the good. They miss out on their blessings. And the other thing that I saw missing were people waiting for their ministries to drop out of the sky. But this this one I did right. Until you are faithful in another man's ministry, why should God give you your own? I believe Jesus, 30 years, had to be faithful in the household to where his character and his manhood developed, not his ministry. The man, ratio 10 to 1, cultivating the man before ministry. The character development is more important than where you work, what kind of job you have, if you're reaching your full potential, all of the me, me, me stuff. In reality, you develop the character and your character will keep you and bless you no matter where you go, no matter who you're with. But I found out that, try this. I did it and it worked. I was in a thousand member church and God just laid it on my heart. You bless that man. Now by blessing that man, I was going to be faithful 
to pray in whatever way would make that man successful. Now, I was a 20-year-old. And then God gave me something practical to do. Like he's building his building. I carried block because I had no other skills. I carried cement block and did that for weeks on end to make that man successful. I wonder if how many people even think like that. I was doing it as unto the Lord. I wasn't doing it. And I purposely did not make myself seen or heard. But in the fullness of time, I don't even know how it happened, stuff that I was doing was working. And I had a little parachurch ministry that was bigger than some churches. And little by little, all of a sudden, this pastor of a thousand member church said, you, Dennis, you, Larry, you. And he picked four, four of us. He said, I want to bring you in and give you a practice preaching course. We did the little practice preaching course, and he says, you're going to preach in my church Sunday after, after the thing. He said, I want, to, I want to hear that sermon again. And I still remember that was the five C's of a communicator. So I want to know what those five C's are of a communicator. And I preached, and when I was done, now mind you, I'm, I'm like 20-something, 30 and he says, you can preach to the most mature person in my church. I like you. Now, if you're faithful in little things, isn't it amazing how God can do big things? I didn't promote myself. To this day, I don't promote myself. I've never asked for a speaking engagement in my life, even when we we're doing traveling speaking. If nobody asked, we didn't do it. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask. I'm just saying, for me, it was. And... I look back on that, and when it was time for me to start my church, two internationally known pastors, plus my friend, uh, who's well known now, all called at the same time. My friend, uh, who's a billionaire now, but he handed me $500. He said, God told me to sow this in. You need to start your church. And I go, no, no, I'm submitted. I'm submitted to the, my spiritual father. I'm submitted. I'm not time for me to start a church. Uh, no. Two other international pastors came and said, we want to take Dennis Clark out to lunch. For what? They ganged up on me. And they said, God is saying it's time to start your church. I didn't have to promote myself. I didn't have to get complained. I didn't have to get bummed out. Somebody was standing in the way of my ministry. You're faithful in little things. God can make you faithful in bigger things. That's a character quality. You can't be in false independence. Because I know what other people have done in that same situation. Well, nobody's going to see me in this place. Nobody's paying any attention to me. I better go and make my mark. Hmm? Isn't that pretty logical reasoning? I'll tell you what, I'd rather know that God brought those people into my life supernaturally. So much so that, that, that the one man when I was troubled with different things, I wanted to know about this church that I went to 20 miles away. Driving down the street, my car, the wheel snapped out of my hand, turned into a Presbyterian church. They took me downstairs, and there was that man that I was concerned about. And was, you know, what was he telling me? And he'd go, Do you know who I am? And I went, No, but I'm having all this spiritual stuff happen, and I don't know what's going on. He said, I'm the man from that church 20 miles away. And not only that, but when 80 people came forward, roughly, 80, 100, he said, I have a habit of singling out one person, and I singled out you. And God told me, you're going to see that young man again. And he gave me the scripture that you hear me say in most of these sermons. He said, God who has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. So I don't plan to ever retire because my life is a story every single day that I'm alive. I'm fulfilling the purposes of God. And you should have that same attitude. And when I was told, Dennis, by experienced people, you're an equipper, not an enabler. You know what the difference is? Yes. 
An enabler, you, you, you make it so easy uh, that they just depend on you. No, you equip them, you teach them how to stand on their own two feet. And the attitude, the bottom line attitude for all of us should be, and I hope this is imparted, if I can do this, you can do it. If I can do this, anybody can do it. You really get that inside of you and, and you will see God prosper you, but you will be a blessing to other people because you believe anybody can do it because it isn't about you. It's about what God's trying to do through you. If he can just get through you instead of living a confined, restricted life on the inside. <sighs> totally dependent. And then we grow and become independent. But you do not reach mature sonship until you are interdependent. And that means you can take and receive the input from other people with more experience. If you cannot do that, if you cannot inquire, and you would be shocked at how many people cannot inquire of someone who has more experience than them. It's like it's a point of pride. They would rather sink than humble themselves and ask for some input. And you know, you don't have to do what they, what they say even. For heaven's sakes, but at least humble yourself. I am weary of independent Christians who tell you God told me, but they never had the humility to inquire beforehand. They tell you after the fact, well, God told me. You know what that means if they didn't have the humility to inquire beforehand? It means they didn't want talked out of it. They didn't want a contradictory opinion. All of that has to die if you're ever going to grow up. Many have not had a spiritual father. My spiritual father said he did not have a spiritual father. So what he did was he basically a lot of times was mentored by books. But he says his spiritual father became peer level. He found someone that basically he could bounce stuff off of. And he was the healthier for it. There are people in leadership that when Jennifer and I traveled, they would say, Dennis and Jennifer, um, would you do one-on-one -on -one appointments with our staff? And we'd say yes. And I would pay attention to the ones that included them. I don't think much of a pastor who says, Dennis and Jennifer, come and do my staff, but skip me. And by and large, most of the churches we went to, the pastor included themselves. That's a leader. And they were well known for being good leaders. But they weren't afraid to include themselves. They were not above. You know, I know the general doesn't travel with the troops and all that stuff. I've seen that. But I'll tell you what, is he approachable? Can you inquire? And I've gotten, oh, I shouldn't say this, so this get me in trouble. But Jennifer knows. I'll answer the phone any time of the day or night. Call it an addiction. But I've always made time for anybody that ever contacted me. But there's a whole lot of people that should have <laughs> and shipwrecked because they wouldn't. Hmm? Well, I get a lot of phone calls <laughs> this week. But it's the truth. It's availability. And my favorite thing is to troubleshoot. It'll save you some disasters. Bounce something off of somebody with more experience. Are we scare any people out yet? No. Well, there were some watching my Ustream and go, oh boy, am I glad I don't go to that church. I'll just keep watching on Ustream. <laughs> mm -hmm. The hindrance, the hindrance to coming into that third level of interdependence is basically fear of being controlled. And there's a real fear there because we've got boy leaders that their idea of authority is to control you. But then I saw the opposite when we traveled and it broke my heart. There were pastors who prided themselves in release. I don't control nobody. No, and you don't take responsibility for anybody either. So, I mean, somewhere there's a truth between those. Truth is, is, a, is the tension between two extremes. What we need more and more in the body are pastors who don't do it for you, but don't 
recognize the stewardship that they're entrusted with. It shouldn't be that hard, but it can be. But boy leaders become authoritarian and people are running from that kind of an authority figure. They don't want to be controlled because they're independent. But there's a solution to that. You can't control somebody who's under control. And if they got rooted down in God and were under His control, they would be healthy enough to be interdependent with other people. And, and you would gather healthy people. Right now, the independent people who are not healthy, their friends are usually not healthy. And they get their advice from unhealthy people. Oh, that ought to be good advice. Huh? Unhealthy people getting advice from unhealthy people. Okay, I'm going to change this now. I'm going to give you the evidences of a false independent spirit in addition to what we've covered. But then I want to cover what mature sons are. But you could actually put fathers. That's men and women. Mature mothers and fathers in God. It should be your goal. But here's evidences of a false independent spirit. What are my rights versus what can I do to help? That's a real common one. What can I do to help? That's almost non-existent. It's what are my rights? Where do I fit? Where do I belong? What's my title? What can I do? The second thing, using people to further their personal ambition. Here's a telltale sign for that. This is 42 years of watching this. Hi, Pastor. I think God's called me to this church for a season. They got one foot out the door already. So they're going to somehow come to see how they can use this to their benefit. They don't care about the people. And also the other tactic is, they're so, oh, we just love Dennis and Jennifer. I am so attached to Jennifer. I watch to see how they love these people. You don't love these people. Don't tell me you love me and Jennifer. That's right. Right? Love my kids. <laughs> Always want compensation. That's kind of like a hireling. They don't do anything unless there's compensation somehow. What's in it for me? Apathetic toward the vision of the house. A false independent spirit is apathetic about what is the vision of Kingdom Life Church? What are they trying to accomplish? Uh, what's that mean, DNA? What, what, what's, what, how do they, what makes Dennis and Jennifer tick? What vision did God place on them? Not one they picked. What vision did God place on them to fulfill? Do I feel part of a desire to fulfill that? And fortunately, it's an equipping church. And almost everybody in this room has applied what we've taught to other people. That's the mission, because that doesn't, that doesn't happen in a lot of churches. There's no reproduction. Almost everybody here has helped somebody at one time or another with what we teach, right? Hand, whether you handed them material, whether you told them how to drop down, whatever, you've done it. That is basically what I mean. You're not apathetic toward the vision of the house. So somehow it's in your DNA if there's any excitement in teaching other people to do the same thing. But a false independent spirit disconnect. They're apathetic toward the vision of the house and they, they're discontent. And the only people they'll hang with are other people that are discontented. And they don't know how obvious it is. Have you ever heard someone say something and they sounded like someone else? That's an easy one to discern. When all of a sudden someone... Well, how come you don't do such and such? Oh, and then I hear someone else say, How come you don't do such and such? And, I'm, how, and then I notice all three of them are friends. <laughs> I'm giving you 42 years of experience of what not to do. All right? Short term vision. Versus a relationship of a son. For though you might have 10,000 boy leaders, you do not have many fathers. Now, 
if you're a mature son or daughter and you're in the marketplace, you're in church, here's some of the capacities that you'll have. See if these capacities are in you. And if they're not in you, they need to be in you and developed. First of all, do you know how to set an order? Which means, do you have a big picture? The big picture is a sign of a, well, look at it in a natural family, a parent. A parent has to see the big picture. The children see, I want that. I want to do this. I'm going to be a fireman. What does, what does the parent have to do? They have to see a bigger picture than that to know what gifts to develop in them, how they're different from the other children. A father's going to have that capacity to see the differences and help those that can be helped based on the ones who want help. And you can't force anybody. <laughs> like Jennifer's dad, Jennifer, you got two choices. They gave you an IQ test, and you can be a lawyer or a doctor. That's when the rebuttal, the resistance, and the rebellion came in Jennifer. You can't make me be a lawyer or a doctor, right? Imperfect people brought into one accord. I believe that that's what a spiritual father is to do. He knows the people are imperfect, and you know your children are not perfect, right? How many know your children are not perfect? Otherwise, you need a course on that. Right? But the beauty is, is the family has crazy uncles too. All right? The ability of a leader is how do I bring into unity all these imperfect people? How do I love all the imperfect people? Some you have to discipline straightforward. Some, if you discipline them, they would fall apart. Some, you have to let them discover certain things for themselves, and you give them a long leash. Others, you better hold them on a tight leash for their own good and their own safety. You don't train them all up the same. I believe if you're truly a father, like I had spiritual fathers, more than one, they were able to raise fathers. They were proficient in understanding both the immature in the church and the intermediate. And today I'm speaking to the intermediate. I'm uh, adult adolescence. I'm not talking about your chronological age. I'm talking about your spiritual experience of being interdependent and the ability to build relationships. Accept opinions that are contrary to your own and how you respond to them. The other thing that I noticed is not only are they proficient in knowing their audience, knowing if I was speak, if we did that sexual seminar, if I had all single people in here, that sexual seminar would have taken on a totally different approach because your audience is different. You have to know that. You don't just say, this is what I want to say. In our case, we had all older people and married people. So we covered the subject accordingly to your audience. A proficient father is, understands not only the child and the young man, but they're anointed to bring direction and life purpose. One of the weakest things I see in the prophetic movement are people giving directional revelation without any responsibility for the result. You follow what I'm saying? If I give you directional revelation, I'm here. You can come back and say, that wasn't good. That didn't work. But there's a lot of prophetic voices giving you directional revelation. Primarily in the prophetic, it should be dimensional revelation versus directional revelation. Explain it. Dimensional revelation means revelation that brings you closer to Jesus. Dimensionally character building. Dimensionally growing and maturing. Redemptive. Directional is go here, go there. There's too much of that. They don't know. And they're not there to help you if it didn't work. <laughs> and you shouldn't be going. Directional revelation should come from people that you trust that are invested in you and they're going to be there and accountable after they give you that direction. If they give you direction. 
I'm very cautious about giving directional revelation. But it's funny that the false independent spirit, God told me this, God told me that, God told me this, God told me that, and then they shipwreck here, and they shipwreck there, and they shipwreck there. And I'm supposed to believe that God told them. How many think this is a hard message? Raise your hand. Oh, I can't make it any harder. You people like hard stuff. <laughs> All right. Actually, a true mature person at the third level, mature sons and daughters, should be a coach in all of your relationships and see people as part of a team. Uh, I'm talking your secular jobs, school. You can be a coach and you only coach where it's in your jurisdiction. If it's not your jurisdiction, keep your nose out. You're not the king of the Publix parking lot. I was not a, hired by Publix, therefore my, my, uh, all my wasted energy and who should park and how they should park and what they should do with their carts when they're done is none of my business. I should pertain to the things. You cannot force a team. You can only coach a team and then you leave the pieces to see whether they respond or not. And if they don't respond, you better let it go. That's all you can do. But in time, you'll know who the team is. You'll know where the knittings are. You'll know where the relationships are. You'll know where the stability is. You'll know where the security is. You'll know where the family is. Those are three elements everybody needs, whether you believe it or not, even if you're part of the larger body of Christ, <laughs> that universal body. Well, <laughs> some of them are so loose out there, I always said, well, then what happens when you want to get married or buried? Then get the larger body of Christ to do it for you because you don't know anybody. Oh, I never thought of that. Well, just get that ambiguous, ethereal family. If you are mature, you cultivate your leadership skills and you develop those people individually, but you have a clearly defined home base. In other words, go here, go there, run here, run there, do whatever, but do you know where do you return to if you had a problem? I don't care how mature you are, you need to have that capacity. Who could I talk to if, in my endeavors? Huh? We had missionaries that had meltdowns on the mission field. But they had relationship. They called us and they said, I've got some young people in Russia, Dennis and, 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 and uh, another pastor. And we were asked by the president of Zion Bible College in those days to go to Russia that they... He had some beautiful Bible students, but they were hurting. But they had a place to call when they were hurting. They weren't just stuck on the mission field. And we went there and we resolved it quite readily. You've got to be connected. It's, that's not a sign of immaturity or weakness. That's what the devil tries to do. He tells you, if you're connected properly and you have relationship, that somehow you're weak. No, it's wisdom. Your sphere of influence should also overlap. The most beneficial thing for me as a pastor was having other pastors who were not in my jurisdiction that we could glean and compare notes, learn from their mistakes. They could learn from some of our successes. You mature people should have mature relationships that overlap somehow. You need somebody that you can talk to at your level. And friendships will tell you a lot about where you're at. Hmm? I believe that if you're going to mature, you need a deep, rich revelation of Jesus. Not a, just a superficial one. And that out of that deep revelation, 
you'll be able to weigh out the extremes and you'll be able to help other people weigh out the extremes. Uh, and things happen in the body of Christ and there's a lot of the supernatural that you have to know the difference between a thrust and an extreme. You follow me? A thrust can be something that is temporarily being moving through the body of Christ and in many cases it's pointing to a higher truth and it's for instructional purposes. An extreme is when you can't stop, even after it's stopped. I think I lost them on that one. <laughs> In other words, something that used to happen by the power of God, now you're making it happen without Him. Yeah. Um, and remember, leadership training... Sons and children do not produce strong leaders. And there are many independents that are basically really need mentored even in those initial stages. You know, uh, we've got a spiritual son and daughter in Connecticut, huh? They got senior pastor that we were friends with, he died of a heart attack at 40-some, 43. And our friends were thrust into ministry to take over a church. And that was like shock therapy. He only knew the business realm. But at the same time, we stayed on the phone, and for the first three, five years, walked them through the stuff and they are thriving and extremely successful to this day. But you've got to have, you can't be afraid to ask other people that have been there and done that some of those questions. They've got a wonderful church now. But it was so funny because I could never get him on the phone. And he's, he just, and I go, how come you don't answer your phone? I got to call your wife to get you. He goes, well, I wait for the voice message. Well, I don't leave voice messages. I'll call back later, you know. And I said, why do you do that? He goes, because I know I'm supposed to help people. And I want to hear what the problem is before I answer the phone. <laughs> oh that sound innocent enough? But that's a man that cares about people. But he wanted to, what do I, what do, I do with these questions? <laughs> the Bible I understand. People I don't know. And then we taught them how to, Jennifer, come on, stand up here. I want to show them real quick. Oh, I got to close real quick with this one. When we did altar ministry, I would have people come up and I'd pray and I'd say, close your eyes. First person or situation, nod your head. Feel the feeling, nod your head. Now let, let the Jesus in you from your spirit go to it and through it. And release loving forgiveness from your heart until it nods your head when it changes to peace. Okay? The first two years we trained him in his church, he said, I counseled my entire church. I said, you did? What's the pattern? I don't know. I said, you don't know? You counseled your entire church? Yeah, a couple hundred, 250 people? You should have seen a pattern. I said, what did, exactly did you? He had him come in his office, sit down in a chair, and he'd say, first person or situation, nod your head. <laughs> Feel the feeling, nod your head. He did his whole church like that. No wonder he didn't see the pattern. I said, no, no, that's for altar ministry when it's nobody else's business. If it's a one-on-one, -on -one, you can actually talk. So we all need instruction, don't we? We all need troubleshooting. So Father, right now, this day, give me a hunger to... Recognize that it's not about chronological age. It's about, the, it's about the condition of my heart toward maturity. Teach me to be more open and available to relationships that you placed in my life. And it's not about my likes or my dislikes. It's about divine appointments becoming divine connections. Divine connections come into divine alignment. And that alignment is so that I can fulfill the purposes of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. 
Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.